Today's scripture reading is from Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in his maker. The sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with timbrel and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to wreak vengeance on the nations and chastisement of the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. This is glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. The psalm read for us this morning is next to the last of the 150 psalms we have in the Hebrew Scriptures. For the most part, it is a wonderful, wonderful expression of love and passion by the ancient Israelites. It starts out with singing a new song, praising God in the assembly, glad for the makers, rejoicing in their king, dancing, making melody with the tambourine and the lyre. It has to do with God taking pleasure in God's people. It has to do with God adorning the humble with victory letting the faithful exult in glory, singing for joy on their couches. And then the psalm turns to another side of life. Six through nine verses are very much different than what we just referred to. Let the high praises of God be in their throats, and a two-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron, to execute on them the judgment decree. This is the glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. And I am reading this psalm saying, how can this be? This wonderful outpouring of joy and adulation and dancing and singing and wonderful accolades, so to speak, to God Almighty. And then the dour statements of 6 through 9 I just referred to. Some have said verse 9 is better translated an act among them the justice to enact among them the justice that is written. In reading this scripture, I'm so reminded of today's events and the struggle of people getting along. The struggle today of accepting the diversity of one another and the pronounced goodness and love and forgiveness that's found in the entire Bible. So as we read a psalm like 149, and then we think of the good news of the gospel, we have some work to do as to how this is justified. How can we be a people praising and glorifying in the goodness of God and at the same time, carry out a life that goes after others with a two-edged sword. So I have to do some deep thinking and reflection in relation to this story <laughs> written at least 2,500 years ago. And think about the life and the exercise of the Israelites 
as they carried out their life in worship and relation to the God, and then the way they went after their enemies, taking the lives of so many people. So within this grand mix, I recall a friend of mine, Matthew Fitzgerald, who tells a story about a group of deep-pocketed fundamentalists who spent thousands and thousands of dollars on a demographic search trying to decide where to plant a brand new congregation in the Chicago area. This group then decided on my friend Matt's neighborhood for their new start just four blocks away from the congregation he served. He said this group started immediately with bombarding the community with slick advertisements, promoting their in-church coffee house and their version of fidelity to scripture. So Matt and the church, he was serving the United Church of Christ, felt it was important for them to distinguish themselves as well. They immediately changed their church sign, their marquee. Matt took down the, the bake sale advertisement, and he put up a quote attributed to Karl Barth. We take the Bible too seriously to read it literally. Well, the backlash started. A week later, the new fundamentalist church made their announcement, unveiled on their sign, and it read, We take the Bible too seriously not to read it literally. Well, the interaction escalated. Matt saw the sign and he danced back to his church office and he gleefully pulled out the box of, of uh, marquee letters. And when he finished spelling out the word hypocrites and he started to reach for the T in fascist, he remembered that Jesus calls us to turn the other cheek. And his exaltation faded quickly. I would suggest for our thinking this morning, there is something so intoxicating about religious certainty. It fuels great worship. It made my friend Matt run four blocks down a busy street. And it helped the psalmist in today's reading praise God with dancing and tambourines in song and excellent and exciting ancient glory. With God at our side, anything is possible. Such certainty can also be a terrible, terrible problem. You and I know well what happened on September 11, 2001. We know the history and that there can be awful, awful things done in the name of religion, particularly religious certainty. Religious certainty can oftentimes be inseparable from religious violence. This is a claim that the war in Iraq proved true for us in the United States. We remember the members of Al-Qaeda who found fuel for their attacks in their religious certainty and in response the United States leaders at that time justified an attack on Iraq with an equal amount of religious certainty and conviction. And I have learned again and again the words of the historians, not, not only this country and the world, who say that all wars carried out 
by humanity are based on religious certainty. So it was not too many years later in 2004 in the State of Union Address, the then president said, quote, I believe that God has planted in every human heart the desire to live in freedom. So we convinced that God prefers, prefers democracy for every country in the world, we went to war in order to expand its sway. And we know what's happened to Iraq and Afghanistan since that time, the long 20 years war. The thousands of lives that have been lost, the degradation to those countries wherein we ended up pulling out and running like scalded a dog with his tail between his back legs. So there is a presupposition that God is on our side. And so we take revenge. And so we have crystallized those verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. Praising God at the same time using that two-edged sword. So this portion of the Bible, as it influences our lives, is something to be wrestled with. Let the high praise of God be in their throats and a two-edged sword in their hands. What is this about? Do we as church members stop to think the ways in which we have expressed ourselves by thinking God is on our side. As I look at this passage, I think it's important that we look at the attitude of the ancient Israelites. Does God really want us praising God at the same time swinging a two-edged sword? We have the example of the Crusades out of England about 700 years ago. The Crusaders decided to conquer Jerusalem. So they raided along the way and traveled a thousand miles, moving into Jerusalem, taking the lives of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of Muslims so that they can just take back the city in Jesus' name. We are so powerful and so quick to believe that God is on our side. And so, <coughs> as I think about this passage this morning, I think about the main thrust of the Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, not just that thrust that we read about in the Hebrew Scriptures. I think about how Jesus Christ was a revelation of God's character. And I think about how we must reckon with a non-violent God. This God that was disclosed on the cross of Jesus Christ on Good Friday. Rather than triumphing over the enemies and evils of his time, and repaying evil for evil, Jesus defeated evil in another way. He did so by turning the other cheek. And so this is what is at the heart of the gospel. And so in these moments, I invite you to consider yourself and your life as a long road trip. In that road trip, you do not have your CD collection or your iPod or your cell phone. All you have is an automobile with a broken radio. You're not even able to listen to the late Rush Limbaugh. He's not coming through. 
Neither is national public radio. Instead, I would like you to imagine that the only station you can find in that broken radio is playing the most amazing piece of music that you have ever heard in your lifetime. It is magnanimous. It is beauty. It is the best you've ever heard. It soars, it ebbs, it reaches the crescendos. You are so thrilled and taken up, you press the pedal to the metal as you race through this beauty. It affirms you, it convicts you, it helps you make sense of life. It is so wonderful. But please remember that your dated radio is broken. While the music is occasionally clear and you're loving it, there are also interludes of ugly, grating static. And so most of the time you have to listen to both. This wonderful piece of music in competition with the hiss and the fuzz of a rope broken receiver. So you are straining and buying for clarity. And now I invite you to hear the stories of the Israelites and also Jesus as this piece of music. The piece of this magnanimous beauty in music is composed by God. On the other hand, in this story, the authors of the Bible are your broken radio. <clears throat> Sometimes the transmission gives us the whole true story, pure and simple in form. At other times, God's beauty is hidden within the static of the ancient politics and the prejudice and this mixture of religion and war. So it's found there in these unfortunate verses of Psalm 149. The signal of the entire Bible, including the Gospel, are lost. The signals get weighted down with a ugly hiss and a static. And so we live in a day and age when there is a plethora of opinions. There is the prejudicial side of life. There are opinions everywhere having to do with politics and religion and how to be people of peace. And so there's some questions directly before us. And I've written out two that I feel are really important. Are we going to, as people of faith, listen indiscriminately, confusing the static the static of the ancient nationalism and the way they carried out their life and worshiped God and went to war in God's name? Or are we going to listen to the symphony of the message of the gospel all the way from Genesis to Revelation that includes the beauty of God's life and forgiveness and all the reformation that has taken place through the centuries. A second question I have, are we are going to listen to the glorious music of this non-violent Lamb of God who conquered the sin of the world by offering his life for all people? In asking these questions, our lives are going to be turning out to be quite interesting as we grapple 
and as we listen and as we weigh and to decide how we are going to respond as people of peace in this old world that has so many layers of prejudice and religion and political opinions and voices on radio and television and newspapers. Witnessing by the scripture the ancient Israelites who conflated this violence with divine ends and mixed them together. In our day and age, it is most appropriate that we do some exploring at the intersection of our American way of life when we sort and choose and decide will we be people who pronounce our integrity and the way we live in the name of Jesus Christ, the peace of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. And so with these thoughts, I conclude today, and I'm also in the midst of building what I call the election sermon that comes around every two, sometimes four years, having to do with the election that you and I participate in a week from this coming Tuesday, and some of the ways to think about being people of God actualizing the good news of the gospel in Jesus' name. This is our faith under the mercy. Thanks be to God.